There's nothing about the future monetary policy here. There are some partial derivatives. There's some math floating around here, but I held back. Um, you know, I was tempted to put, have, use a continuum of states, put it all in L infinity, and use fresh A derivatives, but um, I held back from doing that, which I think you'll all be glad of. So first of all, I'm not speaking for others in the Federal Reserve System, and I thank a wide range of people for their comments without implicating uh, any of them for the content. So there was a lot of discussion this morning, and I, I suspect there'll be a discussion after I leave as well, about the distinction between um, actual probabilities and, um, and uh, risk-neutral probabilities. I don't know if I actually know what an actual probability is, to be honest. Um, the sort of the theme, the starting point for this exercise is going to be that whatever the notion of probability you have in mind should depend on the decision problem that you're facing. And the decision problem I'm going to be uh, 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 talking about is an abstract one, but it's motivated by uh, some of the considerations that I think about in my own work, that a policymaker needs to make a decision today. And that current decision results in random future net benefits to society. So by net benefits, I mean they could be positive or negative. Uh, so they could be cost, in fact. So your decision today depends on your outlook, your forecast, but I'll, I'll stick to the word outlook, about what those net benefits are. As I bear, you, you want to choose the decision that ends up with the maximum uh, uh, outlook for net benefits. So what's the right notion of probability? What's the right notion of an outlook for this policymaker? That's the question I'm going to be asking today. And the answer is going to be the needed outlook is not a purely statistically, statistically motivated predictive density uh, that comes out of a, a statistical model which is attempting to, to, to forecast. And you know, this is a very sophisticated uh, audience, so I, I think I can say this, that what's, when I say statistically motivated, really what's at the heart of that is a different loss function. Okay? That being, being uh, when people think about trying to estimate a predictive density, they're really trying to minimize a particular kind of, uh, a kind of, kind of loss function. I've got a, a very specific decision problem in mind here. It's not, not going to necessarily match up with that, that loss function in the, in the forecasting exercise. Given the problem I've posed that the policymaker faces, the right answer is that that policymaker should use an asset price based risk neutral probability density. It doesn't need to do, try to separate out, parse out the uh, probabilities from the, the true probabilities out of these prices at all. Now, the main result is going to be a, a relatively simple one. And it's that the policymaker is going to reach the same ex ante decision by maximizing social welfare and maximizing risk neutral expected benefits. So, by risk neutral, I'm going to be meaning that you're forming the expectation by using these risk neutral probabilities that come out of option prices we've, we've, that we heard about in the first session. Maximizing the statistical expectation of benefits is, is typically going to be different. And the intuition for the result is that the policymaker is going to want to weigh social benefits in different future states against each other. If you want to maximize social welfare, the way you would want to weight those future benefits is by using the household's ex ante relative marginal valuations of resources in those states. That's a, a long-winded way of saying something pretty simple, that if you've got a, a loss in one state and a benefit in another, and you want to weight those against each other, how you weight those is going to depend on how you value resources in the one state versus the other. It's not just going to be based on how likely, according to some true probability or some forecasting uh, models, uh, assignment of probabilities. It's going to depend as well about how much um, value is associated with resources in the one state versus the other. This is what's captured in that second sentence. If you want to maximize social welfare, you want to capture those households' ex ante uh, relative value, marginal valuations of resources in those states. So risk neutral probability densities are derived from financial market prices. And these prices reflect households. And some of you are thinking households. It really reflects traders. And I'll come back to them. We'll talk about that. Because that, you know, that's a very reasonable be, uh, thought to be having in your head. But for now, I'm going to say those prices reflect households' ex ante relative marginal valuations of resources in different future states. And so the risk neutral expectation 
also weighs benefits in different states according to those households ex ante relative marginal values of resources. So you want that information in prices is actually information you want as a policymaker. It's not information you want to somehow strip away in order to get to something else. So that's going to be the, the theme because you want the, you want the full valuation, marginal valuation according to, uh, that the households, households have. So the outline for the talk is going to be uh, pretty simple. I'm going to have a, a general policy problem that I'm going to put forward. And I'll, uh, more than this in the slides, I'll emphasize sort of the critical feature of that policy problem, uh, more in my words than, in the, but than it's in the slides. Uh, I'll define risk neutral probabilities. Uh, after what we saw this morning, that's somewhat uh, uh, unnecessary, but I'll do it anyways. I'll show the basic equivalence. And then I'll talk through, I think the, the probably the mo I'm told the most interesting part of the talk is actually section four, talking through the possible concerns that one might have about this. And then I'll wrap up with conclusions and uh, we can you know, have, have a discussion at, at that point. So here's the problem. Policymaker chooses an action, A, today. And the result of that action next period depends on the realization of a random variable X. And here's where I, I assumed it was, had a finite number of realizations and uh, didn't, didn't go crazy with uh, more than that. And the outcome, AX, results in some kind of benefit for society, B of AX. This is all, I think, uh, fairly, fairly abstract, but fairly simple at the same time. And that benefit may be positive or negative, so it could be a cost instead. The key thing is going to be that this benefit is measured, as you'll see, it's measured in terms of goods, in terms of consumption goods. Right? That, units that units is a, a key thing. Right? It's not measured in, in utils. That would give you an, actually a different answer to this. I'm measuring it in terms of, in terms of goods. So here are a couple examples which I'm going to go over extremely rapidly because they deserve more, <laughs> more attention. Uh, if you want to talk about them, you really want to have a, a separate talk on each of them, I, I would say. But so two examples that, that uh, one might think about here is the problem of an inflation targeting central bank. Their target is pi star. And then they choose a level of accommodation, which is essentially a choice of, of how much in, uh, uh, inflationary pressures they want to induce next, next period. And then there's a shock that's going to be realized after that choice is made. So they're choosing a level of accommodation that's going to induce inflationary pressures next period. And they're going to, uh, there's, a, there's, a level, there's an inflation uh, shock that uh, leads inflation to deviate from what they expect. The loss here is being measured in goods. Okay? This is the loss of deviating from that pi star is an approximation of the quadratic. The quadratic part's not, not, not critical, but the loss is being measured in goods. There's a financial instability example, which is even more abstract. And that is that uh, you can think about a bank uh, decision to pay dividends now, or maybe the, the, the regulator is deciding how much dividends to allow the bank to pay. And the next period, there's going to be some uh, level of financial stress that occurs. And then the, there's a benefit associated with you allowing to pay out more dividends. That's going to uh, result in more stress. Um, if you don't anticipate any stress, you know, that will give, will give rise to a different uh, answer for this. Again, this is being measured in the amount of goods being lost to society. That's what that B of AX stands for. OK, so now you're going to see how this, is, this comes in the form of goods as I write down what, what consumption is. So if realization XN occurs, the households consume Y of XN. So this is some uh, exogenous endowment plus uh, B of AX then. So a lot of you probably, you, you know I'm a macro kind of, so I'm using this representation thing. You're all worried about it. But I'll come back and talk about that. Okay? I'll come back and talk about that. So the, this, is, uh, the, this is the random endowment or random consumption that they have from other sources. And then this is the, the, the um, net benefit that's being imposed on them by the, the decision of the policymaker. Okay, so now. We have an ex-ante uh, subjective expected utility that's uh, the pi n is their expected utility, subjective expected utility. And then there's a utility function that's defined over, um, might depend on state as well, might depend on xn as well. And it's a function of um, then their, their consumption. The pi n's are subjective probabilities, they're not true probabilities. So the, you know, the, the 
in the rational expectations revolution that, that swept us up in the, the late 70s, there was a, a uh, you know, I think, I think a, a useful modeling approach to simplify the modeling of where these subjective probabilities came from was to simply assume they came out of uh, some well-designed forecasting model. The, the households were all little, little, little uh, 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 statistical forecasters. And that's a model that works well probably in some settings and not so well in others. This is designed to be uh, robust to that, to that, to that, to that, where these, these subjective probabilities actually come from. The optimal choice of A for the policymaker, so the policymaker is going to choose A to maximize this ex ante subjective uh, expected utility. And that's going to give rise to this formula. This is the derivative of the, net, the marginal net benefit of associated with the choice of A in state n, state xn. That's the first piece here. It's got to be multiplied by the marginal utility of consumption in that state, and then multiplied by the subjective probability of that state occurring. So this is just, as I say, maximizing this function with respect to A. You'll have <coughs> a partial derivative of B with respect to A in every state. Then you have to take the chain rule, so you have to take the marginal utility consumption outside of that. And that's what this is supposed to represent. And so that's, that's what the optimal choice of A would be. To do, answer this question is actually pretty hard, uh, even if you allow me the representative agent formu a formulation, which you might not be willing to let me do. Um, the household, the policymaker needs to know state dependent marginal utility and also household subjective probabilities. You might have some good data on, I say no good data on these, that's a little extreme. But certainly, uh, you know, it's not something you look up in, uh, on the St. Louis, Fred, uh, the St. Louis Fed's website is, is data on these two objects. The goal point is that the relevant information here is going to be encoded in the risk neutral probability density. So let's go to risk neutral probability. So the households are going to trade assets before the policymaker chooses A. It's not, it's not such a big deal. They, they could also trade assets after, after the policymaker chooses A. It, uh, it wouldn't affect what I'm, I'm going to say. And we've seen this already in, in one of the talks. Um, I think Steve was talking about Q of S being the, the state price of consumption. I'm going to use in QN for that same notation, implied price of goods in state N. And then we're going to call Q star is going to be the, the QN divided by the sum of the Qs. Now Q star is called a risk neutral probability density. What, to say it's a probability, what all that it means is all the Qs are, po uh, are not actually non-negative. Um, even that's not quite right. So non-negative, and they sum to 1. That's what I mean by the word probability here. Now when the households are getting together and trading assets before the policymaker chooses A, they're going to treat A star as, as given, the choice that the policymaker makes. In equilibrium then, this is just the first order condition of the household's problem, the price is going to be equal to the uh, probability of the state taking place, subjective probability, times the marginal utility of that, of that state taking place. So the QN star is just equal, equal to this. So this is just the first order conditions from the household problem. Now, I, as I suggested at the very beginning of the talk, I'm not, I'm a little shaky in what people mean by the true probability density. I, I find when I actually ask people, dig down with, you'll get a lot of different answers to that. So whatever it is, though, this isn't it. <laughs> you can, you know, whatever you mean by it, it's pretty unlikely this is what, what that object is. Q star reflects the household's marginal utilities, and it also reflects the household's subjective probability. So there's no sense in which it would be necessarily a true probability density, which I think generally people mean that they have built a forecasting model of some kind, and, and the probability densities are coming out of that. Uh, it's very, that's a very loose description, though, because forecasting model itself encompasses a, a wide range of, uh, of, of objects. So now I'm going to define my random variable an E star operator, the risk neutral expectation. How am I going to do that? You give me any, any random variable that depends on xn on, on, on the ends, and I can take the expectation by just multiplying each realization by q and then, then averaging okay, and adding up. And these are my risk neutral uh, expected benefits. OK, so that's all. At this point, all I've done is essentially definitional, I think. I don't think I've done anything. Uh, there's th this part is, 
is more than definitional that, that actually the, the Q, this is coming from the, the household's optimization problem, the Qs are equal to the, the marginal utilities. Now I'll state the, the basic equivalence result. Suppose the policymaker were to choose A so as to maximize the risk neutral expectation of benefits. Now, of course, the, remember, the policymaker's goal is not that ex ante, it's to maximize ex ante social welfare. But suppose the policymaker is choosing A so as to maximize E star of, of benefits. Then the policymaker's choice will satisfy this first order condition. That's just taking the partial derivative of, of B with respect to A, and you're finding the A hat where that expectation is equal to zero. That's just definitional. OK, so what's E star? Well, E star is just given by these Q stars. So what I'm saying is zero is equal to the risk neutral expectation. I've got to put the Q stars in here of that partial derivative. But we know that for some xc, that is for some constant, those Qs are just the, uh, the, con the constant multiplied by the um, pro subjective probabilities times the marginal utility of consumptions. You know, this is going back to first year microeconomics uh, in, in uh, graduate work, but you know, in, in probably your classes have gotten a lot more advanced since I was in school. So you probably would see this even in, in uh, undergraduate economics at this stage, that what this is, is just saying that the relative price is equal to the marginal rate of substitution. The relative price of consumption in two different states is equal to the marginal rate of substitution of consumption across those two states. This indifference curve is touching the budget line. That's what this is saying. Because that indifference curve touches that budget line, that means that the Qs tell me information about this object. And then we have this. That the A hat must also satisfy this object that uh, where I've substituted out for the Qs for the, with the, the, uh, mar the, uh, the subject, the marginal rate, the marginal utilities of consumption times their probabilities. And then I've got those weight, the, the marginal benefits. But this is the same first order condition as I got from the, uh, the when I maxed by social welfare. Really another version of the second welfare theorem just be, being replayed for you. So maximizing E star here only requires a knowledge of the, the benefit of this as opposed to trying to go through this first order condition is that if I try to find an A hat that solves this, all I need to know is the Q stars. And that I can get from market data. Whereas this thing, as I, we talked about earlier, I can't just look up data in, in, in FRED and, and find the pies and the marginal utilities of consumption. So this is the summary of the main result then, is that the policymaker's optimal choice sets the outlook for the marginal net benefit equal to zero. Now that is standard economics. <laughs> If you asked uh, anyone, what the, uh, any economist, what the answer to how do you solve for the optimal choice in a problem, it's to set the marginal net benefit of, uh, relative to that choice equal to zero. Now I'm saying it's got an outlook because you're choosing today and uh, the outcome occurs in the future. Again, that makes sense. The question is how do you figure out the probabilities to, to inform that outlook? And the right answer to that is to use E star. That's what the uh, argument is. And, Policymakers should be balancing benefits across these states of the world using the household's relative marginal valuations of resources in different states. And these relative marginal valuations are going to be given typically, they're going to be, they're going to be given by this risk neutral probability density, not by a statistically uh, uh, estimated density. So that's a verbal, the verbal summary of the, the results. Now, there's a number of concerns one might have about this argument. I'm going to talk about some of them, and I'm sure you'll raise others uh, in the discussion. So the first thing that comes up when I've talked to people about risk neutral probabilities is that they predict poorly. This is true, but it's irrelevant. And the reason it's irrelevant is that when I'm making a decision as a policymaker, I'm acting as an agent of the people in the society my decision should be based on their relative valuations of resources in different states, not some forecast of what those different states, states might be. And there's, there's a couple of ways to try, to try to argue about this. I mean, maybe this is going to be too abstract to talk about the, my fruit, fruit examples, but if you have, you can think about consumption in one state versus another as being, one being a bag of apples, another being a bag of oranges. 
if you just use the probabilities, you're just adding up the fruits together. Whereas what you really want to have in there is the relative valuation of the fruits that the households impose on that. Well, that's the same thing that's being done here is you don't want to be just counting up how likely things are. You want to be putting in there as well how much households value resources in different states of the world. There's no reason why these should necessarily be, be predictive. And, you know, there's a long literature on that. Now, one thing, of course, that, you know, given the way I, I, I originally wrote this up, I can, uh, I can tell you with all the heterogene, heterogeneous households, potentially incomplete markets, it becomes really hard to follow. So let me talk about heterogeneity first. Households aren't the same. The basic equivalence result extends as long as you allow me to do redistribution of resources generated by the choice of A. Um, so what's, gonna, what, what, what's the problem with heterogeneity? When I choose different A's, different actions, that can lead to redistributions of, of wealth across households. And the, the way I can um, rescue the result is as long as I can offset that using transfers. Basically, by maximizing the expected risk neutral benefit, the, the risk neutral expectation of the, margin, uh, of the benefits, it's as if I was maximizing the pie to society. Then there's a question of who gets what in that pie. And you know, this just comes up in the free trade argument. Economists are, are famous for arguing for free trade. But you know, that, that argument that you're expanding the social pie through free trade, which is right, relies on the idea that it, it's only a uh, clearly beneficial if you have the ability to reallocate across individuals. That's the same is true of my, of my result. Once you have heterogeneity, uh, you, have to, you have to be able to redistribute in order to be sure that maximizing the pie is, is the right thing. So costly information acquisition. One of the concerns you, you hear about targeting a particular asset price, and here what's going on is you're targeting a particular asset price. The asset price is the asset is the one that pays off according to the marginal net benefit of the, of the, of the choice. And you're trying to keep that price equal to zero. So you have a, a, a portfolio that's paying off according to the, the marginal net benefit. And you're trying to keep that price equal to zero. If, in, in, if in investors know that, they have no incentive to get information about future payoffs. So then the policy choice doesn't adequately reflect available information. This is a big issue in the monetary policy uh, world. Um, people question, wonder about how you should be targeting inflation. Should we, we know that we don't influence current inflation. We're trying to target future inflation uh, when you're an inflation targeting central bank. So what, how should you be measuring how well you're doing on that? Um, and one of the concerns is that if you're just targeting, say, inflation expectations, break-evens as measured in tips, then tips might lose their information. Everyone knows what the central bank is going to do. So why would people collect information on, uh, on a individually? I think what's true is this concern is at least mitigated. I, I, would, I might go even further to say it's, in, for most probability distributions, will be, be eliminated by existence of options with varying strikes. As long as you have enough options out there, investors are going to be trying to gather information about each outcome. As, even if the policy, even if the policymaker is working to try to keep this one payoff always equal to zero, so there's still an incentive to gather information, even if um, the, inf the policymaker is trying to target this and, and keep it zero. And this is sort of <laughs> when constructing our NPDs, risk neutral probability densities, we do need data from on, on prices for many options with different strikes anyway. So um, it seems like we're, we're, we're going to need that that in any event. OK, so I've been uh, implicitly assuming um, completeness of markets. So given observed assets, there may be multiple risk neutral probability densities. This basic equivalence result still extends as long as, for any action A, the benefit is spanned by the payoffs of observed assets. So as long as this, the benefit of, of the actions is, is spanned by the payoffs of the assets you see out there, that's going to tell you how households value these, the, 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 the benefit of each action. Okay. So the whole game plan here is to figure out how households value your taking action A versus action A prime. And the way to figure that out is by looking, as long as this is spanned by the payoffs of your observed assets, you can figure out what that, 
how much that, that's worth, uh, that each action's worth to each household. Now, even without spanning, we could find upper and lower bounds um, consistent with the absence of arbitrage. So even if there is an incomplete set of assets and we're not able to span um, the, the benefit exactly, um, we can, can usually um, um, figure out upper and lower bounds uh, that, 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 will, that, that are consistent with the absence of arbitrage, and that can be helpful. I think the biggest argument I hear about this is that few households actually trade in option markets. And I think this is a problem if they're barred from participating. If you look at limited participation models in finance and in macroeconomics, the way they usually work is there's a set of certain set of households that get to trade in option markets and there's a certain set of households that don't get to trade in option markets. That's pretty implausible, right? I mean, the idea that people are just banned from trading in options is a little extreme. What I'm going to argue here is it's more plausible that they're choosing not to participate given their marginal valuations of these options. And this would suggest that their relative marginal valuations of resources in various states is really similar to that implied by option markets. I think more work should be done on figuring out to what extent this is valid or not. But I think that uh, I think allowing people to choose or not to participate is, is I think, a better modeling device. And the other, the other piece of it is that you can certainly, once you allow for differences in subjective expectations across people of what payoffs might be, you could start to see why they might choose differently about whether to participate in various markets um, um, than, uh, than not. So the asset prices could differ because of liquidity, um, not risk differences. And this is a potential issue. That, so, so what I mean by that is that options with similar strikes, or you're using option prices, as, as Ken described uh, earlier this morning, you're using options uh, with different strike prices to back out these risk-neutral probability densities. Well, what happens if options with very similar strike prices actually have very different prices? The right response here, I, I think this is a potential issue. And the right way to deal with it, I think, is to try to do what you normally do in these situations, is, is try to pay attention to robustness. It's not to. Uh, totally abandon risk neutral probability densities com completely. And that, I think, goes through uh, for all the concerns that I went through. I would argue, I think these are, there's more legitimacy to some of these than others, and, and uh, they all push you in the direction of doing more work, which is you know, good. But I don't think any of them push you back to the solution to you shouldn't be using risk neutral probability densities. It's rather you should be thinking about those in a richer way. Not, they, they don't push you back to, let's figure out what the true probabilities are and use that as your way of weighting uh, marginal benefits across, across states of the world. So let me wrap up. Policy decisions often impact the economy with a lag. And so policymakers need some way to gauge the relative likelihoods of future events. You need to know how likely one event is versus the other. In the monetary uh, um, central banking world, you want to know how likely is deflation. How likely is high inflation? With financial regulation, you want to know how likely is uh, significant financial instability. So the typical approach is to try to figure out the true probability of these future events. What's the true probability of high inflation? What's the true probability of, high de of, of deflation? The point of this talk is, as a policymaker, that's not the probabilities I want to be using. The probabilities I want to be using is a risk-neutral probability. They're encoding the ex-ante marginal valuation of resources in different states of the world. And that's what I should be encoding as well in my decision making is the relative valuation of marginal valuation of resources. To be even more concrete, the risk neutral probability of deflation could rise because households view that outcome as more likely. Or it could rise because the household's marginal utility of resources in that outcome has, has risen. One of those. So it could be that we go out and look, and you can back out the risk-neutral probability of deflation. They've just gone up. Could be two reasons for that. People, you ask them, and uh, you ask them what they think their beliefs are about deflation. They say, well, we think deflation is more likely. The other is they, th they think that deflation, when deflation occurs, things are going to be bad. So their marginal utility of resources in that state of the world is going to be high. Both of these changes should matter for a monetary policymaker in, the way, in terms of whether or not, who has the ability to influence the likelihood of deflation. So we, we've heard a lot about 
decision making about using risk neutral probability densities, it's, it, it's not always easy. You need to determine the appropriate financial proxy for relevant events. Um, and uh, available options might be too short. Uh, you, they might not cover the extreme tail events you might be interested in. You know, this is not nothing new in policy making. You want to be using a mix of good judgment, good data, and good modeling choices um, at, 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 whenever you can. The question is what your goal should be, right? Should we be using our, our good judgment, good data, and good modeling choices to drive towards the best possible statistical forecast of a particular event? Or should we be using our good judgment, good data, and good modeling choices to drive towards the best model of risk neutral probability densities that we can? And the, the, the answer I I, 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 I'm suggesting today, or arguing today, is in fact it's, it's the former. That's it. Certainly happy to take questions. Household heterogeneity can cover an enormous range of things, aspects of the household, the age, family size. And the most important in terms of when you're trying to back up these distributions is, of course, their wealth, net wealth. And there's a lot of evidence in Britain that households that are way below average net wealth, i.e. deeply in debt, don't participate in markets. And that does not seem to me to entail that they think these options have a similar value in different states of nature. They just they simply haven't got the option to participate in options. Not that they're barred, right? I mean, they're, and most of the, the people who do are in the top 1%, 5% of the wealth distribution in many countries. And you think of poor African villagers. It's not that they're not participating in some stopping, because there's no way they could actually participate. Those mobile phones are just beginning to change, and maybe they will. But I worry that you're using the wrong people's preferences if you rely purely on RMDB? No, I think, I think this is a very reasonable comment. Um, just to clarify what I was saying, it's that, um, you know, if, if, even if you're, um, you're a poor, um, you, you have choices about how to spend your money. And if you perceived that there was a big value to investing in particular kinds of options, then, um, you would do so if, even if you were poor. So the point is simply about the relative marginal valuations of resources. If your relative marginal valuations of resources in different states are wildly different from what's out there in prices, there's a gain to, gain to trade. That's all I was trying to say. With that said, um, you know, the question is what wildly different means and, and how you, I, so I think that's a very uh, legitimate, legitimate comment. I think the, the right way to be thinking about that is to be trying to be impute as best we can what risk neutral probability densities will look like for a, a wider range of, 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 of people than perhaps are necessarily represented in, in, in uh, trading data alone. Uh, at least, what's the, the, I mean, I think that this is an issue though, to, to, to back up even maybe a more general level. We use market prices in policy making all the time. <laughs> And this is a problem in the use of market prices in all sorts of settings. And these are, this is the right question to be asking about the use of market prices. And somehow, it, but it does not negate the use of usefulness of market prices in those settings either. That's all, that's all I would say. We know central banks, Bank of England presents band charts, the Federal Reserve at the conclusion of the FOMC, some FOMC meetings presents forecasts. Would you like to see those forecasts move in the direction that you're suggesting here? I'm trying to think about whether I'm be answering about monetary policy at that point. <laughs> um, no, I think I think that it, you know I think uh, Ken described. We certainly want to be getting uh, policymakers to be using this more as part of their vocabulary, as more of their thinking about policy. Um, at this stage, you know, I think the discussion about uh, both the fan charts and the FOMC. Uh, um, uh, forecast you described, um, clearly, you know, that's not the thinking that's going into the, the construction of those, those probability ranges. I think it would, at, at a minimum, be uh, useful to have some of that information being presented. Uh, I, I, uh, at a minimum, be useful, I think. But the second thing, I'll, I want to take a little bit of a step back from using the risk neutral probability as the object of our attention. I think you're right to think this way. But it may well be that you want a separation between those and preferences because the tools you affect in the policy might directly go to one part of that. So the tools.
tools you have might affect the probability of something occurring, the natural probability, that will feed into the risk neutral problem. And indirectly by affecting things like wealth and corruption, it will affect the trade off between the things. But you want to make the separation if you think the library is pulling the actual probability, not directly the risk neutral problem. Right. I think these are, this is again a, a useful question. and. And I'm going to give an answer which I always hated, which is I, in a previous, a previous formulation of this talk, I think I, I, I talked a little bit about uh, about that that issue. I I think there the but the, the punchline is I think this is a certainly a useful thing to be thinking about. Um, I think one of the issues is I'm interested in sort of subjective subjective probabilities and not just true ones. And so how my actions as a policymaker influence that or is important as well. So I would, that's the only parsing maybe I would give to what, what you're saying. And then there's a, you know, everything is an approximation. There's a question about how big that term might be. And, and, and I, for different decisions, I think that would matter, matter differently. I think the main uh, issue you face is not so much from acting as a policy or not necessarily academic. You're getting the limited participation argument that has already mm -hmm. I'm very sympathetic. I, I, I will say I've been successful in this presentation. If this is the questions and that we're worrying about, that's these are the questions I want people to be worrying about. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I, I think we use asset prices have been extremely well studied and um, relative prices in some other some other markets, and so we're extraordinarily aware of very fine problems in asset pricing markets compared to how aware we are of them in other markets. Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean we shouldn't be thoughtful about our use of them, but it doesn't mean the fact we've put so much care and resources into the study of these uh, these particular prices doesn't lead, should not lead us to meet, think that they're somehow less relevant than the prices we use on an everyday basis for other other policies. But I I, I like your idea of trying to to use information that we can to, to provide bounds. I think that's a very very interesting idea. Uh, your comment that we should be your your your. Objective for policy is to maximize so somehow subjective welfare. You, yeah. take the, you take the household's own opinions about what makes them better off and yep. you try and maximize those. And I, I wonder if that might suggest that, well, if, if they're wrong in some sense, or I mean, wrong about probabilities, if, they could, if policy could be directed not to change anything, but just to get them wised up a little bit about what the true probabilities are. And on the other side, is there, could there be some policy that would be directed more towards their marginal rates of substitution uh, rather than to any kind of objective changes in uh, uh, economics? So you should feel better about the, about this state that you, you hate it. <laughs> I mean, it's not really so bad, you know? <laughs> Why don't you just loosen up and, and go with the floor? Right. Maybe it would be easier to increase welfare that way. <laughs> uh, well, that's going to be other people's skill set more than my own. I would say that second second thing. And, you know, certainly we have, I think, public officials who try to try to try to implement that second approach. In terms of the first approach, the uh, first question about the use of subjective, uh, certainly, you know, the Fed puts a lot of uh, emphasis on financial education, which is part of that is to try to ha have the public be more informed about about things like probabilities, what they mean, et cetera. Um, but there is a premise in here that um, we're, we should not be in the game as policymakers as sort of inventing our own objective function relative to, uh, th there is a working premise here. It's not necessarily bought in by, by everybody, but there, that's definitely a premise here. But the idea that we want to provide more education to people about how to think about these, uh, the, the, what, 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 
randomness means, I think, is, is, is certainly a very reasonable one. Well, I thank everyone for their attention and for their questions. I very much appreciate it. <laughs>